What's it feel like having two kids on the bench with you? It's exciting, and I love it. We talk about a lot of different issues. It's fun to discuss legal issues with the two of them, and of course, uh -huh. both of them always team up together against me. But um, <laughs> it's interesting to see what their viewpoints are on the law and on sentencing and on different cases and all that kind of stuff. So it's, a, it's an interesting perspective. Mm -hmm. What prompted you to run for office for, for judge 37 years ago? I had always been involved in politics and I practiced law and I practiced poor people law for a long time. And um, it was just a natural you know, evolution to run for office and run for judge since I was practicing and you know, I wanted to do something mm -hmm. in, in politics. At the dinner table, did you talk about this with, with the kids' presence? They have always seen the court and been around the court. Jeffrey is very, very, very independent and a person of deep thought and penetration. So he and I go at it in terms of political ideas and philosophies. And then Sydney is equally smart, but she will approach it more subtly. But both of them differ from me. They, mm -hmm. uh, neither of them agree with my, what, how did Jeffrey put it, my uh, perspective on justice. <laughs> is there, what about that, Jeffrey? Is, is there a difference in, between mom and son? Well, I think it, it, it's a question of when did you sort of grow up in the law, right? So Judge Sappho grew up in the law during a time where it was a real leaning towards harsh sentences. Um, you think about the 80s and, and, and the crack epidemic. And, and the answer at that time from real smart, thoughtful people was to incarcerate. And I, I came up seeing the long-term negative effects of that process of mass incarceration. So it's, it's, it's a question of timing, um, but there's been a consistent commitment to fairness on her part that I've tried to model myself after. Mm -hmm. So there's sentencing and then there's general fundamental fairness. And so we're the same. In, in our view of the need to make sure that everybody gets a fair shake within the system. Did she turn you toward the law, or was she an inspiration for you to go into the law in the first place? Well, she was certainly an inspiration. Um, you know, when you see people that, that sort of look like you, there's a belief that maybe you can do these things as well. Mm -hmm. When my father and Judge Saffold got married, um, you know, I, I immediately had in my life a strong black female role model and, and I took advantage of it. So I would, I would pick her brain whenever I could. I'd go watch her in municipal court um, and just watch her mm -hmm. uh, as, a, as a judge. Did you ever contemplate perhaps medicine like your dad, like of Oscar? Of course, of course. Dad had talked to you. <laughs> until, until, until chemistry in college and I knew it was over. It wasn't for me. Yeah. Was dad in one ear and mom in the other ear, <laughs> medicine and the law? Not so much. I mean, they knew that I was a, a, a sort of a natural advocate. I was always arguing yeah. on somebody's behalf. Mm -hmm. Did you and your brother ever talk about the law kinds of things when you were growing up? So it's interesting, Jeff and I are 17 years apart, so I didn't get to have my childhood with him, but when I was 17 years old, I shadowed him for a month in court. Um, so I obviously grew up in the home with my mom as a judge, and yeah. then I got to go watch Jeff litigate, and he was mm -hmm. a criminal defense attorney at the time. And the first time I saw him in the courtroom, it was, he was in the middle of a trial, and he got up there, and it was like he was walking on water. It was <laughs> magical. Um, and so from that moment, I knew exactly yeah. how I would be what I wanted to be because you have to practice to become a judge. I think even as a little kid, I always aspired to be a judge because mm -hmm. of my mom is my role model. Mm -hmm. But uh, then I, when I finished law school, I began practicing with my brother. Uh, and so my whole entire legal career was in the office with Jeff, trying cases together. Mm -hmm. um, and so we've spent a lot of time talking about the law as adults, and then I became addicted to watching him. I'd come hang out in their office with all the other young attorneys that were in his office when I got off mm -hmm. of, out of school yeah. and, uh, and when I came home from college as well. Now you're brand new in municipal court. Yes. Kind of following, following mom. Mom, Shirley, was in municipal court before she crossed over to common pleas. Does she kind of school you on, on how to 
how to handle yourself in municipal court? So I've had the benefit of practicing in the building. Uh, most of my cases were felony cases. I had some federal cases and some municipal court cases. But I've had the benefit of coming to watch them both on the bench um, to kind of pick up on how they handle different aspects of adjudicating cases, sentencing, how they comport themselves during trial, the rulings mm -hmm. they make on different motions that are brought before them or objections yeah. in a trial. Um, so as far as being a municipal court judge, we have talked about it uh, because the cases are different downstairs than they are upstairs. And so I have different work to be done. Um, and my goal being down there is to help as many people as I possibly can and divert them so that they don't end up upstairs in mm -hmm. felony court. And we have so many resources available to do that to kind of fix the person instead of trying to fix the problem, which I think is what happens up yeah. here quite yeah. often. Judge Shirley, when, when the family gets together, I mean, is there talk of legal stuff or do you talk of other things as well? We do both. We spend a considerable amount of time talking about resolution and uh, our philosophies on justice and that kind of thing. So we do both. Is this in the bloodline? I hope it is. Mm -hmm. I, I think that it's a great profession. I think that it's an honorable profession. And no matter what's in the news now, this is a great profession yeah. to, to be a part of. And um, you have the opportunity to do really positive things. Yeah. You're getting close to retirement now from, yeah. from, from the bench. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mandatory. Uh, yeah. Are you able to walk away? Easy. I have spent 37 years here. I've seen every kind of case. I've seen every kind of tragedy. I've seen the great joys. I've seen the rehabilitations. I've seen it all. I'm ready to absolutely walk away. I don't want to be a visiting mm -hmm. judge. I don't want to do mitigation. Mm -hmm. I don't want to do any of that. Mm -hmm. What must the judge keep in mind when the judge is on the bench and there is a case out before you? Well, I tell everybody, you got to remember that basically people are good. People really want to go about their business, take care of what concerns them, and they want to do good. Now, there's always the exceptions. And I think that as a judge, you got to learn to distinguish the difference between those who have good intentions and those who don't. I think that you need to always act so that you enforce the law but that you also look out for the community and the individual. You gotta remember that the person is a person and your decision is not go only gonna impact them, but usually it impacts their entire family. Mm -hmm. Jeffrey, you were nodding amen, amen while mom was talking uh, about that. Did, you, did she talk about these things when you were thinking about going into law, when you were thinking about even running for common police court? For sure, she's always focused on wanting to make certain that her rulings help keep the community safe. And, and so we, we always talk about that and think about that. We, our, our focus has to be, as judges, doing what we can to help keep the community safe. But then where it becomes complex is that you want to keep the community safe while you also focus on some of the things that Sydney was talking about, like trying to help the people who are in front of you. Mm -hmm. I mean, you ought not be a judge if you, if you don't have it in your heart to try to help people because you have so many opportunities. The only question is, do you take advantage of those opportunities? Yeah. Yeah. And, are you, and are you thoughtful enough to do it in a way that allows you to help these people while still remembering that first principle, which is to keep the community yeah. safe? Yeah. Sydney, g g give me a thought on this whole thing about the family of judges. I, this may be the only case like this in the United States, I'm told. We're, we're checking where, where we got you know two generations or, or three in a family who are all judges inside the same city. Hey, give me a thought on that. Um, I think it's truly remarkable. So growing up, I've always felt like I had big shoes to fill because I'm the last of my parents' kids and the youngest. And I, everyone is successful. I've looked up to everyone, and I had these remarkable role models in the house. My brother kind of touched on it earlier. I hope what I, our family means for the community and that uh, you can't be what you can't see. So we are one of the only black families in the country that we're aware of that has accomplished this, for sure in the state of Ohio right now. 
I'm the youngest black judge on the bench in the state um, out of 722 judges, I think. And I think it's so important that we have the opportunity to inspire people to see a young black woman that little girls can identify with, a really cool guy like my brother Jeff <laughs> who can make it this far. I think that's the most important and impactful um, meaning behind what we've accomplished. I cherish it and I want to protect it with everything that I've got so that we can be the stepping stone that someone can stand on our shoulders and go further and do more and do even better than us. Yeah. Might there be another uh, generation following? Well, Jeff's got a son in law school right now at George Washington. <laughs> yeah. my, my sons are only uh, 10 and six years old, but we, we've, we've exposed them to all of this. I've grown up in this building my whole life and it's funny now that I'm just starting and I'm getting to meet department heads and all the individuals that are on staff with my court. There are women and men that I'm meeting that remember me being five and six years old running around. And um, we, we've both done the same with our kids. I think it's so important to show your children what you do every day for a living, particularly because we've always been angled towards helping people. My mom from the bench, my brother and I advocating for those that a lot of folks consider to be less than. To, to me, I don't see people that way. And, yeah. I, and I expose my clients, I did when I was practicing, to my kids. And, and I expose my kids to the courthouse. And so perhaps it will ping some interest in, in them as well for when they grow up. You know, Leon, you mentioned our younger generation. Jeff's son went to Atlanta to work for the senator that's running now. So, you know, some good things are happening. And plus, he was standing here working for his father, and he was so excited to be able to stand at the polls and, you know, ask people to vote and stuff like that. So I think, you know, we got something going. Look into the crystal ball. What do you see for your kids now? I often wonder if Sydney's going to stay on Muni. She says yes. I think Jeff, I don't know if you're going to stay or not. He we'll likes see. practicing. I loved practicing. I did. I, I was a defense attorney for yeah. 25 years fighting for folks. But I really enjoy where I am. Just so many opportunities to help people that come before you with whether it's drug addiction issues or mental health issues. And particularly from our community, there are so many people who live their lives not appreciating the mental health issues that they're struggling with. Mm -hmm. And it's not sometimes until they come before the court where there's a diagnosis given and we're able to reach people who didn't know that they needed reaching. People talk about their lives as though it's like everyone else's lives. And then when you start to peel away, you realize they've got all kinds of strife that they've never dealt with. So I'm enjoying being right where I am. So uh, even though the judge is unbiased, sitting on the bench, hearing both sides, when it, when it comes time to uh, sentencing and all of that, you take all of that into, in, into account wh where people are coming from? Absolutely. This is an interesting story because there's three Saffolds on the bench all at the same time. And it's, it's Black History Month with three African-American uh, uh, lawyers who became judges. But I think larger than that, um, if you really look at this, what you see is just people who had role models that looked like them, right? I could look at Judge Saffold and say, hey, maybe I could be a judge. Mm -hmm. So now Judge Saffold's going to retire. I'm on the bench. Somewhere there's a young brother who's, I hope, seeing me and thinking, hey, maybe I could be a judge. So, you know, Sydney talks about coming to watch me, and now she's a judge. So she had both myself and Judge Sappold as, as role models for her. Amen to that, Sydney. Amen to that. Yeah. There's so much good to be done, and I, I, I love Muni Court. I think it's the best job in the world. Mm -hmm. And I feel like oftentimes as a practitioner, particularly as someone who loves to advocate and to help folks, as a practitioner, sometimes my job felt almost Sisyphean, like you take a glass of water and throw it into the ocean and then watch to see what difference you've made. From the bench, yeah. we have so much breadth and so much, there's so much latitude to help so many more people. And I'm so grateful that I have the opportunity to serve in that way. There's so much good to be done in our community and yeah. so much healing to be had that we yeah. can implement. Is there anything I need to know about the family? I hope that they'll be an inspiration to other people. When I was president of the American Judges Association, there was a chief justice from Arizona who believed that people need, the judges needed to go out into the community and they needed to mix with people in the community and let them know that they were like them. 
So I hope these two will do that. And I, I think that they have that kind of energy that they can meet people and say, you know, yeah, you know, I understand you. You can look to me as a road model. So I think that, you know, these two will do that. And mm -hmm. I, I'm very pleased with that. Mm -hmm. Jeff, a, a final thought. Well, I, I hope that as a, as a society, we don't just look at, at, at these three judges and say, well, they're from a family and they became judges because, you know, because they got this family connection. I hope that it's bigger than that. I hope that there are people who watch this who will say, you know what, I could end up in court and I'm going to get a fair shake within the system because the system is beginning to maybe get a little more diverse at the upper levels. Mm -hmm. So now maybe as, as members of the community, when we think of pursuing civil litigation or whether we're a victim of crime or whether we're a criminal defendant, we might begin to see the bench as more reflective of the community. So I'm hoping that the bench is moving in a more diverse direction. Yeah, yeah. Sydney, we're rounding third. We're heading mm -hmm. home. Bring it home for me. The biggest takeaway from our legacy, not just be as a family, but as, as jurists, is that and I, I've learned this from my brother, that our court should be somewhere you can run to for help. It shouldn't feel like us versus them. You should feel like you can be protected by the system, not abused by the system. I hope that we accomplish that and are able to inspire other like-minded individuals to, to run for office. And I hope that people, like my brother said, people want to feel like they have a fair shake when they come into the courtroom. People with backgrounds like ours, with ideologies like ours, we, I see you from the bench. And it, there's something to be said about being seen and to be able to see. And I can identify with the litigants coming through the court, be it a defendant or a victim or a civil litigant. Um, I see someone that I know in each and every person that comes before me. So I hope that the biggest takeaway is that uh, you, you'll be treated right by the system. And that's, that's what we aim to do, is to accomplish justice and fairness and, and treat everyone right. And that you'll get that from us. Shirley, is this also the story of a proud mother? Yes, I, I think so. As I listen to these two, they're both, their perspectives are from being defense lawyers. I think that we need to also emphasize that we are concerned about victims as well, and that victims have a story to, mm -hmm. to tell and a reason to be there and a reason to expect uh, fairness as well.